And I'm admittedly a little nervous at this point. It's after midnight. I get the car started and it sounds terrible. It sounds very, very bad. So I think to be an enthusiast, really of anything, it requires a very understanding spouse or partner in your life. And a car enthusiast is no different. And I know a number of people have sat in this chair and talked about their very supportive, understanding spouses. And I have to say, subjectively, I think I've, I've done pretty well for myself too. My wife is extremely supportive of most of my car things. When we started dating, when we got married, I had the black Saab 9.3 convertible, the one that I would go on later to destroy and then rebuild. But she knew early on I was gonna have a lot of cars, I was gonna do a lot of stupid things with cars. And at some point, my car collection just continued to build and build. And when I started building the Cannonball car for my first run with my buddy Curtis, I knew I needed a place to store my cars and to work on things. And so my wife finally acquiesced and said I could get a shop. So I found a shop that I could rent. It's like the back half of a building where they work on FedEx trucks and stuff. And it's right in my town, so pretty close by. And I store things there. Uh, and I work on things too. It's kind of like a man cave. My friends and I hang out there a lot. It's got a big TV. Big enough that when you're working on something, you can follow along on YouTube, which is very helpful. It's got a beer fridge. It's got some chairs, sofa. It's got a lift, a couple toolboxes, wash bay. It's a cool place to hang out. One of the deals that we had, my wife and I, when I got the shop was I'm going to work on some of our cars and the money we save on maintenance will help offset the cost. And I thought this was very shrewd of me to come up with, even though I'm not a great wrench myself. I can, I can work on stuff and if I have directions or a video to watch, I can usually figure it out, but I'm not a trained mechanic by any standard. What I've found is over the years, the way this usually works is I work a lot on my wife's car because that makes her happy. And my cars usually end up going to the mechanic anyway. So I'm not sure how much we save, but for the purpose of this story, because she'll be watching, we save plenty. Her cars tend to need some good maintenance from time to time. I would say that she is a solid 10 tenths driver. And so her cars are definitely put through the paces and they certainly need some love from time to time. She's currently driving a Volvo XC90 with the Yamaha V8. And the V8 is really cool. I give her a lot of credit for buying that car because it's just the sweetest engine ever. Plenty of power and that exhaust note is amazing. It's not the same V8 that they had in the Taurus SHOs. Those were smaller, the cams would walk away and all that kind of stuff. This is actually the same V8 that they had in the Noble M600, the twin turbo car. So it's a really cool car. And I remember at one point, I had to do the resonators on there, so I just deleted them and straight piped it. And now the exhaust note on that car is just, it's amazing. I actually sold a Corvette because the exhaust note on my wife's car is better than what was on the old Corvette. I've done a lot of work on this car, but my wife said at one point earlier this summer, it's, it's running a little rough, check engine lights on, can you check it out? Code scanner, says it's got a misfire, thinking, you know what, I don't think I've ever done plugs on this car. Certainly not coils, fairly certain that's what it is. So I order all the parts, take it to the shop one night after work. So it's it's like maybe seven, eight o'clock when I start this job, but I'm thinking to myself, plugs and coils should be pretty quick, right? It's a transverse mounted V8. So you've got the odd cylinders are facing you. And of course the coils pop right out, plugs pop right out, super easy. I get the new ones in there. The even number cylinders are facing the firewall. A little trickier to get to, but not terrible. You gotta loosen up like a strut brace or whatever. But I get the coils out and I get the plugs out of eight, out of six, and out of four. I'm into two. It seems like the socket is going on the spark plug, but it's not catching on anything. I'm going, I don't know what the heck this is. I'm trying and trying and trying, and sometimes it feels like it's snug in there, and you're turning and turning and turning, and it never gets loose. I can't figure this out. And in the back of my mind, I don't know why I made this connection, but I'm thinking this is the Yamaha. They had those in Fords. Fords had the problems on the Tritons where the spark plugs would pop off. So now I'm freaking out, like, what do I do with this? And I, I have a scope. It's not a great scope, 
but it's certainly good enough for me scope. My in-laws gave it to me for Christmas one year and it saved my butt several times. So I take the scope and I put it down into the spark plug well and I can see my problem immediately. The ceramic on the side of the plug had cracked and there is a hunker, hunker is a technical term, hunker of it wedged between the spark plug and the wall of the spark plug well. And so I can't get my socket down far enough to capture the spark plug and that's why it's stuck in there. I gotta find a way to get this hunker out of this spark plug well so I can fix this. And I've got the scope down there and I've got picks and everything and I'm trying to pick at it, but you can't use like a hooked, like a J pick because there's not room to hook it underneath. So I've got just straight picks and I'm trying to like stab at it and I can kind of rock it back and forth a little bit, but I can't really get it to break loose. And I come to a point where I think to myself, if I can get something to stick to this, probably would give me just enough to rock it a little bit extra that it would unwedge itself. And so I'm looking around my shop and I'm trying to think like, what do I have that I can do this with? And I'm like, well, I've got some tape, like different types of tape, duct tape, electrical tape, whatever. If I wrap it around the pick, sticking it in the spark plug, well, that's not working. That's a terrible idea. I've got some adhesive for like a headliner. So I sprayed that on one of my picks, let it get a little tacky and put that down there, applied some pressure. That didn't work either. And I start thinking, and this is now probably like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. I'm getting a little tired. Again, I am not the best wrench in the world. And I'm thinking to myself as logically as I can, my problem isn't stickiness. My problem is I have a very skinny pick. I'm trying to pick up this rather large hunker of, of spark plug. I need surface area. Same sticky, more surface area. What do I have? And I'm a kind of guy, I've got something to drink, got a mint or gum or something in my mouth, right? And I look over my tool bench and there's a pack of gum. This should work. So I take out a piece of gum, about a half a piece, chew it up a bit, get it nice and sticky. And I put it on the end of a, one of the J hook picks that I have. And I put that in the spark plug well and I kind of wiggle it around. I'm watching on the scope. And in my head, what's going on is the gum is now forming itself to all the different crevices and parts of this hunker and it's going to stick and it's going to be just enough to break it loose and be able to pull it out. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. And I try several times and the gum's not working and I quickly say, well, I'm gonna give up. As I'm pulling the pick back out of the spark plug well, near the top of the well, there are these access areas that are normally covered when you've got the coil in there, but I have the coil out so they are not covered here. As I'm pulling the pick out, the gum decides that it is not only going to not stick to the spark plug hunker, but it is done sticking to anything at this point. And it decides to unstick itself from the pick and fall into this well and into the engine somewhere in the car. I'm going, this is probably not a good situation. And it's about exactly this moment that my wife calls me. She goes, you're really late, what's going on? How's the car coming? I go, well, one of the spark plugs broke. She goes, okay. So uh, I'm working on getting the hunker out of the spark plug. She goes, okay, are you gonna get this done? I said, yeah, I'll get it done. Don't worry about it. And I hang up on her. So I'm trying to think now, what do I do? How do I get this gum out? And so I take my scope and I try putting it down this access hole and I'm looking everywhere inside here. I can't find this gum anywhere, but I know it's somewhere in the engine. And my concern is either where does this crevice go to, right? Is it stuck in the engine already? Or if it's not, okay, that's potentially good, but when I start the engine, will there be enough vibration that it will knock it back in? Or do I have some kind of a problem here? And I have no idea to any of these things. Thinking about the, the hunker and the spark plug, I, I go back to that and I'm eventually able to break it up by just stabbing at it a few times with the pick. And I break it up into a couple pieces and I'm using some compressed air and a vacuum and my scope all at once to try to get it sucked out. And I get the pieces out and I get the spark plug out and I'm looking everywhere for this gum. I put the scope down in the cylinder hole thinking, like, is, is it in the engine somewhere? Is it sitting on the piston? Is it gonna be on the back of a valve? How screwed am I here? And I can't find this gum anywhere. I did the only thing I could think of. I did not tell my wife what was going on. I text my friends. So I text John Ross, JR, and I text Jared Pink from Questionable Garage. And I'm thinking if anybody knows, these guys will know. And it's late at night, so I'm trying to be respectful of their time, right? Jared's an hour ahead of me. JR is an hour behind and I go, hey, I, I dropped some gum in my wife's car trying to get a spark plug out. Is this going to cause a problem 
it's sugarless. Like I'm just trying to think of all the information I can give these guys so that they, they know how to help me in this situation. And, th and they both, to their credit, got back to me. They said, well, actually the sugarless part makes, makes a difference because of something with the chemistry and the blah, blah, blah. And I said, that sounds reasonable coming from, from you guys. They said, you're either going to have this thing collect carbon and you're gonna have a very bad day, or it's going to burn off. And the only real way to guarantee anything is to pull the engine and tear the whole thing apart. And I'm like, yeah, I don't wanna do that. So take the risk, I figure I'm either going to put it all together and it's gonna be fine, or I'm gonna put it all together and it's gonna blow up and we have to tear it down anyway. So might as well take the risk that it's fine. So put the spark plug in, put the coils back on the back, tighten up the strut bar and all that kind of stuff, and I go to start the car. And I'm admittedly a little nervous at this point. It's after midnight. I get the car started and it sounds terrible. It sounds very, very bad. Definitely a top end noise, definitely something in the valves. And this goes on for probably the longest five seconds of my most recent life. And then it starts to idle up very high. And it's definitely idling high and I can smell oil burning and I can see smoke coming up between the engine and the firewall. And then it smells a lot like peppermint. My entire shop smelled like nothing but just like if you lived inside of a gum factory is what I imagine this was. And that lasted for another five, 10 seconds. And then the engine idled back down and it smoothed out and everything was fine. I'm presuming what happened is wherever this gum had lay, the engine was not very happy, but quickly heat took over and, and solved its issue. And the gum and presumably some oil went away and that all was well. Took the car home that night. My wife was clearly already in bed. So she asked me the next morning, see my car's out there, is it okay? Oh yeah, it's, it's fine, it's fine, it's good. She goes, did, did you get it finished? Said, of course I got it finished, of course. Can I drive it to work? Go for it. And I'm watching as she's going down the driveway and I'm watching as she's driving down the street. Figure it's okay. So I have not told my wife the gum part, but again, I presume she'll be watching this video. So now you know why I was out so late that night. In my shop on my workbench, I have a coffee cup and inside of it, it has little parts and pieces that all tell very unique stories. I've got an oil drain pan plug from my buddy's pickup that's missing half its threads. And that's when Andy learned not to use an impact on those. I've got a couple other pieces and there is a spark plug that's missing half of its ceramic. When you get a ticket, it might look something like this, but the first thing that you need to do is take a picture of that ticket and send it to 305 305. That will get the ticket clinic on your case immediately. They've got brick and mortar offices in Georgia, Florida, and California, but they can help you find a ticket no matter where you get it in the United States by helping you find a local attorney that will do everything they can to help you avoid costly fines, insurance premium increases, points on your license, risk of suspension, even jail time. They've helped me out with this ticket and many others and a lot of my friends as well. So check them out now at the link in the description below or again, text your ticket to 305 305 to get the ticket clinic on your case. They are the perfect partner in your fight against any speeding ticket.